Okay, so we see we, we've got state of nature and efficiencies, protective organisations, dominant protective association, but then we've got these independents, and we have to somehow incorporate the independents within our society. Okay, so these independents are the people who don't freely agree right, to live under the dominant protective association. But why is it important that people freely agree to live under the protect, protective association? Because remember, what we're trying to do is to, get, is to generate a state where there are no violations of people's rights. And the idea is if I've agreed to be under the protective under the authority of the protective organization, then my rights haven't been violated. I've consented. Okay, now I mightn't like the fact that we live in the world, you know, in which my stuff might get wrecked and stolen or whatever. And so I might prefer it if the world were different and we didn't need protective associations. But hey, that's the world in which we live. The actual world is such that we require protective associations. So if I respond to the actual world by giving my consent to a protective organization, that's not heaven. Right. But um, it's not a violation of my rights. OK, but what about the people who just don't consent? Right? What about the people who just say, no, I, if, to hell, I'd rather live in the state of nature. Yeah, I know it's really in, inefficient. Right. In no sense. I know it's really inefficient, but I would actually rather live there right, than live under this protective organization. What are we going to do with those people? Now, it's kind of interesting here who these people are, to think about who these people are, because for Nozick, they're very, the kind of people in Nozick's mind are very different from the kind of people in our mind uh, today. No, no, as I said, Nozick wrote this, well, he, he wrote this book after Rawls, so Rawls published his book in 71, and Nozick's book came out in 75. So that's the sort of this period of the early 70s, um, and, you know, and Nozick's an American, Right, he's working at Harvard, and he he looks around in the society. Who's he thinking? Who who are the people who are sort of who are who are rejecting the authority of the government at the time? Who who are the people who say we don't we don't want to live under this protective association? Who are they? They're hippies, right? They're they're, they're you know long haired youths, um, you know who spend their life smoking dope and listening to um, the then great popular music and uh, um, bonking every, each other as much as possible and living in a combi van at the beach, you know, uh, or hanging out in San Francisco and, you know, whatever, right? These are the people who, who Nozick's got in mind. Now, the thing about them that's kind of interesting is that, you know, they're kind of harmless. I mean, you know, you may or I call not conservative American society didn't view them as harmless, but, you know, we would view these people as pretty harmless, right? I mean, you know... Uh, at least compared with the people in our minds. Who are the people in our minds? The people who reject the authority of the state, the people who reject the authority of the the order under which we live. I mean, the people is probably most prominent in, in our mind, at least until the COVID crisis pushed our minds in different directions, were terrorists. Right? It's terrorists that we, that we think about when we think about independence. And they're rather more of a problem than hippies. We could probably ignore hippies, right? Although not necessarily. I mean, you know, you still want hippies to obey the speed limit and you still want them to um, uh, to refrain from theft and so on. Um, but terrorists are a big problem. And, um, <clears throat> the kind, you know, I'm not just talking about the kind of cliche terrorist, uh, the modern cliche terrorist, the sort of international terrorist. I mean, there are, if we bring the situation back home to Nozick, there are, of course, famous domestic, but Timothy McVeigh being the most famous example of domestic terrorism within the United States. I mean, Timothy McVeigh was the the man who blew up the um, uh, the federal building in o- Oklahoma City. Um, and then we might think of for ex- other thing about sort of the protesters at Waco and so, and so forth who were, well, not protesters, I mean, the religious cult at, at uh, Waco then, and, and so on. Okay, so and of course, and and international um, uh, terrorism, the kind that's been very familiar, you know, Al Qaeda and what what have you. Okay, so there is a real th- these people are independents, you know. There's no doubt about it. They refuse to accept the authority of the states um, in which they live, uh, you know, the, wherever they are. So, you know, there are people in Al Qaeda who are in Afghanistan or 
or Pakistan don't accept the authority of those states to the extent that it, there is an authority of the state in Afghanistan. Um, and they don't accept the authority of the states into which they move, right? They just don't accept these things. And it's a problem. You can't, I mean, you might think with hippies, you can just say, I'll oh, just, just leave them alone, you know, let them get on with it. But you can't, you don't want to say that with terrorists, right? You, don't want to say, oh, you know, like the, and of course, when we're thinking of terrorists in New Zealand, we're thinking of that, I'm not even going to say his name, that guy in Christchurch, right? Um, you, you know, we, we can't just say to him, leave, just leave him alone, let him do his thing. No, absolutely not. We've got to stop, we've got to stop, stop them. And we, we insist, right, quite, you know, in my view anyway, quite rightly, we insist that the authority of the state applies, regardless of what he thinks. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so there's a problem of independence. Okay, so the independence are these holdouts that won't join the, the dominant protective organization. What are we going to do to them? Now you might say, and indeed of course very tempting to say in the case of terrorists like this Christchurch guy, well you just force them, right? just force them to join. Um, and but but that might not you know that in that in that one case that might make you happy but you know there are problems with that kind of answer I mean um, force them that's that's the kind of argument that leads to Guantanamo Bay and um, Nozick won't have any of that right he says no 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 you've got to actually justify your authority over these people that doesn't mean they have to accept the authority. But you have to justify the, your authority over them, right? You have to be able to justify your authority over them, even if they're not going to accept it, right? That doesn't matter. That's not the crucial thing. You, but the crucial thing is that the authority that you're exercising over people is actually justified. Okay. All right. So Nozick is realistic about this. He knows that in the end, people are going to have to be forced to join the dominant protective association. They are going to have to be forced. You can't make hippies or terrorists. You can't just sit down and reason with them and say, hey, do you realize it? it's not so bad after all? You can't do this. I mean, you, maybe you can do that with hippies, but you can't do that with, with terrorists, right? You can't do that with this Christchurch got an idiot, right? You can't do that. You've, right? You can't. So you're going to have to force them. Um, so what could make that coercion legitimate? Right, and what we're going to do now is to discuss Nozick's argument. Now, I've got to say from the from the get go that I don't think this argument has a hope in hell of succeeding, <laughs> uh, and so I can't present it in a way that really makes sense because I don't think the argument makes sense. Now, it may be that you'll read Nozick and make more sense out of it than I do. That's possible, right? Of course, but. Um, but uh, I mean, this, some of the stuff kind of sticks in my throat because I just don't think it makes sense. So if you're listening to this and thinking, I don't quite get this, that's probably because the argument doesn't make sense and not because you're misunderstanding, right? So just keep that in mind. Okay, so the fundamental problem that Nozick is trying to deal with here is that we're going to have to force the independents to join the predominant protective association, the state. We're going to have to coerce them, and that violates their rights. And that's supposed to be what we're trying to avoid, but we can't avoid it. We're going to have to violate the rights of the independents. Okay, and so the question is, what could justify violating their rights, given that the whole structure of Nose Exposition is that we shouldn't be violating people's rights? Okay, so his argument is this. It's true that the independents have their rights, their right not to be coerced and so on. But we have our rights too. And this is an argument that works much better with terrorists and with hippies. <laughs> I think we, we have our rights too. And in particular, um, as things stand, we are, that is, before the independents are incorporated in society, as things stand, we... So if you can hear my son screaming, he's obviously an independent too. Um, he's having fun. He's just screaming. Um, where the hell was I? Okay. We have our rights too. And those rights are violated by the fear that the independence may harm us. Okay. So imagine that you're an independent 
and I'm not. Okay, knows its claim is that yes, forcing you to join my society will violate your rights. But on the other hand, if you're not forced to join our society, that violates my rights because I have to live in fear of you harming me. Now, I have to say, I think that's cheating because it's what fear is not the same thing as a violation of rights. If so, so for example, if I'm scared that you're going to steal my car, right, that's not the same thing as you stealing my car. If you steal my car, that's a violation of my right to the car. But my being afraid of you stealing my car is not a violation of my property rights in the car. So I, I think that knows it's just cheating here. All right. But, but nevertheless, that's his argument. Right. His argument that is that we have a conflict of rights. You have your right not to be coerced to enter the society. I have my right to be free of fear of having my rights violated. Okay, so we have a conflict here. So we can't respect everybody's rights. Somebody's rights are going to have to lose out. And his argument is that your rights are going to have to lose out, but that's okay because we could compensate you. Could compensate you. That's something I have to stress because you won't actually get any compensation. Okay, as I say, you know, this is hard argument to describe because I don't think it works. Anyway, here we go. Okay. Um, so Nozick's position is this, um, given that what we have here is a situation where we can't, it's called, it's called a tragic dilemma in philosophy, um, we can't, um, we can't respect everybody's rights. Either your rights are going to have to be violated or my rights are going to have to be violated. Okay. So because, because of this, because we're in this situation, we should, we he says that we can violate your rights if we could compens if the result of doing that is means that we could compensate you for that violation. Okay, so because you know ideally we wouldn't violate anybody's rights, but we can't avoid it. We have to violate somebody's rights, right? Because if you stay outside this outside the society, that violates my rights. If we force you to enter into the society, that violates your rights. So we're stuck. We're going to have to violate somebody's rights. And he's saying, well, we can justify in those circumstances, in these circumstances where we have to violate somebody's rights, we can justify violating your rights if in doing so, we create a situation that would allow us to compensate you. Okay, that's his position. Um, and indeed, that's what he says is the case. So... Um, um, we can force you to enter in this, into the society, which makes us communally, everybody overall better off. And that gives us goods, it enables us to create a flourishing society and so on, that would enable us to compensate you. Okay, now... I hope you can see what the structure of that argument is. We have to deal with the problem now, but what the structure of that argument is. The idea is if we just give up on the task of creating the state, right, we're going to just going to go back to the state of nature, which is terrible, right? So what we do is, no, we just go ahead and create a society. We force you to enter the society, which we're justified in doing because we can't avoid violating rights, right? Going back to the state of nature would itself be a violation of rights. So we, we incorporate you in the society and that's justified because A, there's no alternative to violating rights and B, we can compensate you for the violation of rights. Okay, it's important that those two things are true. It's got to be A, there's no alternative to violating rights and B, we can compensate you for the violation of your rights. Okay, he's not saying it's okay to violate someone's rights when you can compensate them for that violation. He's not saying that. He's saying it's okay to violate somebody's rights when you can't avoid violating rights and you can compensate. Okay, all right. Now, here's the really curious thing about Nozick's argument because he's not arguing, in his case, 
that we should give a whole lot of resources to hippies to compensate them for um, for forcing them to join the state of nature. And nor is we arguing now that we should give a whole lot of resources to terrorists for forcing them, them to um, to leave the state of nature and to enter into our society. What he's saying is that it's enough that we could compensate them. We don't have to compensate them. So, um, so what matters here is the ability to compensate, not actual compensation. Okay, so now those of you who have studied economics might recall and that there is a parallel theory in economics of this kind. In fact, it's from this that knows it's getting his argument. So earlier in the course, we talked about uh, Pareto and Pareto efficiency. And we're going to look at that again uh, later in this in these lectures. Um, and remember that according to Pareto, an efficient move is one that makes at least one person better off and nobody worse off. Now, one of the problems that people had applying Pareto's analysis to the real world is that nearly every change in, say, government policy, it, you know, it just it does make people worse off. There's almost nothing a government can do that isn't going to make some people worse off. And so some other guys, in particular guys called Caldor and a guy called Hicks, came up with a new understanding of, of efficiency, which was this. They said, um, a move can be efficient if the person who is made off, made worse off, could be compensated. Not will be compensated, but could be compensated. Now, um, <clears throat> just as an aside here, I, I, for a long time I thought that Caldor Hicks, so this is called Caldor Hicks efficiency, but it's an it's a alternative to Pareto efficiency. So Pareto efficiency says, um, and a move is efficient if it makes at least one person better off and nobody worse off. Caldor Hicks efficiency says a move is efficient if it makes at least one person better off and that person or the persons who are made better off could compensate anybody who's made worse off. They don't have to compensate people who are made worse off. They just would be able to compensate people who are made, the people who are made worse off. And, in effect, Caldo Hicks efficiency is a call for wealth maximization. Now, when I first encountered Caldo Hicks efficiency, I thought it was invented by a bunch of sort of right wingers, you know, um, because, you know, they're not interested in protecting the people at the bottom. It's kind of anti Rawlsian, and, you know, it's a bunch of right wingers. But it's not, it was, that's not it at all. Caldo Hicks efficiency was, was invented to justify state action, right? It was, it was invented to justify state intervention in the economy. Right? The, the idea being, because according to Pareto, state interference in the economy is almost never justified, right? Because you would never have enough information to justify the state intervention in the economy. You just leave people alone to transact freely um, and, you know, they'll move up their, um, they'll move up the, um, uh, their, up their curves. We'll look again at this in, a, in detail later. Um, but the, the state intervention is always forcing people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. So under the Pareto system, that wouldn't be justified. So Caldor and Hicks came along and, and um, produced their new account of efficiency in order to justify state intervention in the market. Okay, and, and Nozick's appealing to the same idea here. It's not that we actually have to compensate the independence, it's that the society is better off to an extent that we could afford to compensate them. Okay, all right, so now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go just repeat the argument that I've just presented, but I'm going to do so with a diagram. Um, now, as always, there are some of you, particularly those of you who have studied economics, who this may help because you know you're used to seeing diagrams of this kind and so on and there's some of you who as soon as i show a diagram your brain will stop working because that's the way human brains are <laughs> some human brains just don't relate to tables and diagrams and so if this doesn't work for you forget it right just fast forward if this does work for you great okay anyway here we go okay so this is a 
This is a graph that we saw earlier. We looked at this graph earlier in the course when we were talking about Pareto. Okay, so we have X, which is the status quo. That's where we are at the moment. And we have, you know, A's and difference curves represented on the vertical axis and B's and difference curves represented on the horizontal axis. And as we know, B is trying to move to the right and A is trying to move up. And Pareto said that everything in three, any move into three is Pareto superior and any move into one is Pareto inferior. Any move into two and four are undecidable. That is, we could never have enough information to justify the move into two and four. Okay, so if you if you don't remember that, you'll have to go back to that lecture and, and, and have a look at it. But one of the consequences of this is that both Y and Z are in the Pareto undecidable range. So Pareto said we could never have enough information to justify moving to Y or Z. But many economists after Pareto thought that that was a very counterintuitive view because surely we we do have reasons to think that there is more utility at Z than there is at X. Because after all, Z is on the possibility frontier. Okay, so what they thought is we had to have a just, we had to, you know, Pareto was a great start, but we had to have a justification that would allow us to move from X to Z. And that's what Caldor and Hicks provided. They said, if we move to Z, then obviously B is much better off a, it looks like, is worse off, but we can't compare them, remember? We can't compare A and B. Uh, a is worse off and B is, is better off, but we can justify that if B could compensate A. Right, B would not have to compensate A, but if B could compensate A, then that would be justified. And that's meant to be a justification for state intervention in the market. Okay, now you, you might pick up on the fact that I'm a little bit <laughs> uncomfortable about the idea that this chart does actually justify state intervention in the market. But what I'm really uncomfortable with is that this argument works for Nozick. I don't think this argument, even if it can work for economics, this argument cannot work for Nozick. Um, what, why? Because I don't see how it gets him out of any of the problems that he had. I mean, the problem is that we should not, you know, it, at, at the end of the day, we shouldn't be violating people's rights. We shouldn't be treating them as means to ends. But surely what this does is treat people as means to ends. The independents are forced to join the society on the basis that it benefits other people at the end of the day. That's using them as means to ends, and I can't see how that's justified. I, I, I don't see how this argument actually gets Nozick out of his problem. He's got a problem with the independence, and I can't see how he can get around that problem by using this appeal to Caldewick's efficiency. It just seems to me it doesn't, it doesn't work. Okay, so, um, and, and as I say, as I said before, I think the whole argument begins with a cheat because he equates having been he, he equates the fear of having your rights violated with having your rights violated and I think that's just simply cheating. So I think actually Nozick's argument really leads not to the minimal state but to anarchism. Now I don't present that as a criticism of Nozick, right? It's it's a criticism in the sense that it means that there's something wrong with his argument, but I'm not saying um, his argument leads to anarchism, and it's so therefore we should reject it. Uh, I don't think that, I mean, anarchism, it seems to me, is a, is a plausible political theory, um, and it deserves to be taken seriously. Um, uh, and I think there are a lot of, you know, there have been, I mean, sometimes anarchism is stupid, but it, it needn't be. It can be presented as a plausible political theory. I mean, Noam Chomsky, for example, um, often presented himself as an anarchist. In fact, he wrote a book about anarchy. And I don't, it, that doesn't, I'm not saying he's right necessarily, right? But it's not a stupid political theory. I mean, people often say, oh, that would lead to anarchy, as if that was it, the end of, end, of the, end of argument. And that's partly because anarchy has two meanings, right? One, anarchy just means chaos, right? And that, I, I'm not saying that Nozick's argument leads to chaos. The second meaning of anarchy, though, the real meaning of anarchy is that it's difficult very difficult or almost impossible to justify authority over other people, right? 
And I think that's what Nozick's argument with the independence shows. It's actually really difficult to justify authority over people. And maybe in the end, you can't. Right? That's anarchism in its more constructive sense. And I, and I think that's a plausible political position.